Cool, all right, well, let's uh, switch gears and we'll talk about stamping, uh, which is another uh, metal forming uh, technique. So here's some common stamp parts. You can see there's um, brackets, fittings. You can do some really cool uh, deep draw, uh, and I've got some videos of that. Um, you can also do some very small parts, and I'm sure in our daily lives we've seen plenty of uh, stamped, uh, stamped components. So some of the advantages of stamping are it's a great high volume um, technique, uh, has a very short cycle time, and it's very cost effective, which is when I say high volume, those are the sort of the two key things we look at. And it's also extremely repeatable. Um, you can integrate multiple features on any one component. Um, so again, it's very similar to injection molding. Uh, you're not, the adding features does add cost in the tooling, but it doesn't add cost to the part. So that um, can be very helpful. It can be very precise uh, and repeatable. And you can also create some giant um, you know, stamped parts. So if you think of like the oil pan for a car or things like that, they, they may be stamped. On the disadvantage side, the tooling can be expensive. So unlike CNCing, where there is no tooling, in this case, you do have to build big heavy steel tools. It takes time to build them, and then they're expensive. And if you have to change your mind later, that's a, a costly thing to do. Uh, it's also very difficult to prototype because you need the, the tool to actually get the part. Uh, it's, the stamping we do is limited to metals. So if for some reason you needed a plastic, stamping wouldn't, would not be a good choice. Why, why is that? Uh, what we would typically do, well, stamping, and that's a great lead in for the next point, requires ductility. You, um, typically, you have to be able to bend and fold the metal. And plastics don't tend to do that very well. Um, they um, will bounce right back. Um, and the second thing is we would look at stampings when we need to get strength. So in general, my first go-to is always injection molding. If I can mold anything, I'll always, I'll always do that. Uh, with stamping, you know, if the plastic isn't strong enough, then, uh, or I need to have it super thin, uh, then, then stamping would be a good choice. I guess there's a difference between stamping and just cutting out. I mean, stamping is creating a 3D profile. Yeah, or there's cutting out forming. Yeah. Stamping with a, so I mean, cutting with a stamp right. would be different. That's though, right? usually called die cutting or match metal die. Cutting. Oh, okay. right. right, yeah, and in that case, if you just needed a planar 2D part for, the, um, for a piece of plastic, then you would die cut it, and, oh. and that works great, and, and oh. it's effective for plastic. Okay. So if you think of, um, yeah, like any sort of a, a flat part. Um, yeah, a credit card or something. Exactly, yep, that, that would be t um, totally fine. Um, with stamping, and we'll talk about more why this happens, but you're always going to get a rough edge on, on, on it, which may be acceptable, it may not, where the die cuts through it. So just taking a look at the process, you can do all these different things from stretching the material, compressing it, forming, bending, cutting it, and then some of the basic um, features are, are listed there. Looking at how the process actually works, so uh, Basically, you'll have the punch in the top and the die in the bottom. For this to work, the, you need to have clearance between the punch and the die. And we'll, I have a video queued up here, but initially it will cut through. Typically, it's about the first third of the material. And then after that, it will fracture on the bottom. And that's where you're going to get your rough edge. So you'll be able to see the burnished edge on the top and then a much rougher edge down here. What I've got here is just a comparison with the machine part, where if you were to put a drill or an end mill in there, it'd be nice, um, nice and finished all the way through. So here's a visualization of uh, what it looks like. So here's the workpiece. The punch is coming in. It's shearing here. And then it's going to fracture and break. And then it's a little bit hard to see, but this is the burnished part. And then this is where the, the fracture would occur. So let's see, here's a, this is a progressive die. So this is a very powerful uh, mass manufacturing technique where you have multiple stages of your die. And literally, you'll just have a, um, a roll of metal come in. And then at each stage, it will perform one operation to cut and form um, the part. 
and then eventually you've got a box of whatever parts you need. So that one you'll see all the time. And what that also does is it automatically indexes the, the part, so you don't need to have a worker reposition it every time, um, but it just, uh, everything is exactly where it's supposed to be. This one is really cool. So this is an example of a deep draw. So that's the part we're going to end up with. Basically, they put a blank in here. This holds it, and then it will create the, the deep draw there. So you can do some amazing things. And the whole trick here is the part that holds it allows the material to sink into the um, cavity, but it doesn't allow it to wrinkle. Otherwise, you can imagine it would be all, all wrinkled up. So if you think of like maybe how your pots and pans are formed, um, this would be a good technique for that. You can also do progressive stages, so get a part way and then move it to the next die and, and draw it deeper and deeper. Okay, so as we think of uh, you know, different um, design uh, approaches and guidelines, one is the material is often bought in a roll. So if you can use parallel edges to whatever part you're designing, that makes it a lot more cost effective that you can just take the roll feed and put it through um, your machine or a progressive die. Uh, you want to avoid, um, again, just thinking of the strength and the life of the tool. You, if you have a very small diameter hole, that's going to wear out that piece of metal really quickly. So if you can, you want to um, avoid that. So some general um, design rules here. Uh, keep your hole diameter at least 20% of the thickness and, and more if you can. Stainless steel is a little bit rough, so in that case you want to have a, um, a much bigger hole just so that tool is strong. And then we'll talk about notches in a, in a second, but again it's just thinking with an eye to preserving the life of the tool. Uh, in general for the materials you can use, it's anything um, from super thin, so a tenth of a millimeter, all the way up to about three quarters of an inch. Um, so you do have a fair amount of variation um, there. For bending, you have to um, just stick with what's possible. So plain cylinders, co cones are all fine, but you can't do anything too funky in the geometry of a, of a bend. It's got to be a, a standard shape. Uh, and then just some general um, rules for the inside uh, bend. The radius should be the, about the material thickness. And I've got some more examples uh, here. Let's take a look at that. So here, if you were bending um, a flat piece of metal into an L on its own, typically due to the distortion, you'd get a little bowing at the, at the end of it. A good technique here would be to put a notch in so that that will prevent the, the edges from kind of uh, oozing out. And that will, um, you know, it depends, of course, on the geometry and what's important. But if that did have to fit between two walls, um, this bowing would be a problem, whereas following this technique would, would save you from that. Uh, so this is a, just a standard flange. In general, uh, just to provide enough strength to the die, you want to do about two and a half um, uh, times the thickness. So this is a, a good one. If you were to do a hole this close to the edge of the part, what would typically happen is that the material would get displaced plastically and move over to the side. And depending on your part, that may not be a problem. But if it is, a good technique here is just to do a um, notch. So you basically get rid of the problem or just chop out the material so it's not, a, not an issue. We talked a little bit while back um, in the design guidelines about notches. So here we've got a flat piece and we're folding up this back section you typically get a stress concentration in this area. So a good way to avoid that, if you can, um, from an aesthetic standpoint, is put a little notch here. And that reduces and actually completely removes the, the stress concentrator. Um, so those are just a few guidelines. There's a lot of other techniques you can use. But just to get you started about um, thinking on sheet metal design. Would, would that bend a notch, would that be done in one action? Or is that multiple hits? Yeah, you would probably have one hit to cut out the profile, which is the blanking, and then the second um, hit would do the forming to fold up that tab. And then a third for the notch? 
I, th I would get the notch as you do the blanking hit. So just two. Oh, get, so you can get the blanking is on the profile. Yeah. Um, get it all in one hit and then bend it. And then you do have a few materials um, available. I just picked three of the common ones. So steel, stainless, and aluminum are often what we'll see in, um, in high volume manufacturing. And these are all very, very ductile and um, accommodate the stamping process. Any, any questions? You mentioned uh, large bender radiuses for 6061. Do you usually do that in a T0 on the carbon, or do you just go straight into T6? We would typically buy the, um, the material already at T6, yep. as opposed to putting it in the, um, the process afterwards. All right, so that's why the huge radius. Yep, exactly. Yep. So I assume the, the, like a deep draw, that, that would change the material properties, like cold, cold harden it or? It, yeah, there's a lot of work hardening that goes on as it, as it gets drawn down. Yep. It's amazing, though, that it, uh, I mean, to, for me, I always find it miraculous that it actually works. Like, you look at it, it's like, there's no way that's going to work. But yeah, just by having the holding plate prevent the wrinkling, the material just fuses, uh, or um, is able to reflow and, and create that geometry. I mean, you can still drill it after that or whatever? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty remarkable. I have some other, other videos I didn't put in, but a whole trimming operation where I, they were making a square pan, so the first draw was a circular cross section, and then the second formed it into a rectangle. And then the third operation was a CNC trimming the edge. Um, yeah, and it works beautifully. So, great, yeah, well. The deep drawing always reminds me of uh, metal spinning, which is probably the precursor. Yes, the, I was gonna it's touch, like, stuff. bring in the old school, <laughs> where, where they have the big ore in there. Yeah. It's amazing that thing doesn't get it's loose. <laughs> it is totally <laughs> terrifying. Yeah, they have some, I think it was making um, rocket nose cones or something oh, like yeah. that. And yeah, just the guy's the working. guy with a big iron ball. Working. <laughs> yeah, the metal spinning, that's its whole, whole other thing. Absolutely frightening. Cool. Well, thank you all uh, for coming tonight. Really appreciate that. And great questions.